Aloha, spooky nerds, and welcome to Talking Strange, paranormal pop culture show with the Den of Geek Network. You probably knew that already because I've said it so many times. And as always, I am your host, Aaron Sagers, journalist, author, researcher of all things weird. Currently, I can be seen on Travel Channel and Discovery Plus's Paranormal, caught on camera, new episodes dropping on Thursdays, now in its fifth season. So, I'm also speaking to you today from Scotland, from Bonnie, Scotland, from Oban. So you might see, and if you're watching this on the video, you might see just a lovely background, some hills, and I see a person walking a dog, and there's a giant fairy called the Caledonian McBain cruising on by. And it's 9 p.m. here as I record this, and it is still nice and light outside. So hello from Scotland. Uh, and and great stories of the paranormal out here that I look forward to sharing more with you guys about at some point. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about my... Uh, the topic that my guest has really been a trailblazer on. He is a paranormal researcher. And let me, just a detour, like, it, you know, the thing I love about the, the, the working in the paranormal, the thing I love about just this community is a lot of us know one another. It, it's so connected in so many ways. And this gentleman, I was, I did not know personally. I knew of his work. and. We were just having a chat backstage, and of course, we know all the same people. So it's it's just kind of like a nice community. Community is really the word I want to highlight here. But he is paranormal researcher, a history aficionado. He is a traveler. He's an artist and a purveyor of strange tales and forgotten hauntings. He is the ever apologetic creator of the orb color chart. I'm going to ask him about that, of course and always endeavored to balance open-minded fascination and humor with logical questioning in the pursuit of truth. And unlike many self-described experts in the field, he is not afraid to admit that he doesn't have all the answers, which you folks know that I love. I love someone that is basically willing to admit, we don't know what the hell's going on. And he talks about ghosts, UFOs, Sasquatch, other mysteries as well, and sees the true value of supernatural stories as a means of keeping interesting forgotten history alive. And he, although he is deathly afraid of heights, he has been walking the tightrope, separating curiosity, skepticism, and humor for more than 20 years. And he's also the author of Queer Hauntings, True Tales of Gay and Lesbian Ghosts, published in 2009. And he wrote a blog, The Queer Paranormal Road Trip in 08. Without further ado, let me bring in our guest, Ken Summers. Hey, Ken. Uh, hello. Nice to be here. Well, thank you for, for joining. And, and, and it's really a pleasure to meet you as i said i'm just familiar with your work and now i'm it's a delight to be able to chat with you i'm i'm curious about your entry to the paranormal because it began quite young did it not a uh, very young yes uh, i guess i would have to say my real first beginning in the paranormal was Growing up watching Disney's Halloween Treat um, on the Disney Channel back in the 80s and the Disney version of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow that was mm. with Bing Crosby narrated. That was my absolute favorite as a child. And I just, I always, I just gravitated toward <clears throat> creepy stories like that. And by, I think I was eight or nine years old when I bought my first book on parapsychology. I still remember, I still have the book, surprise. 
surprising. Uh, it was a Lloyd Arbach book uh, about ESP hauntings and poltergeists, and I absorbed it all. And so I was interested in the paranormal from the very beginning. And by the time I was 16 years old and got my temporary license and all that, I was out exploring new places. I think Halloween night of 1995 was when I went out on my first ghost hunt in a local area all by myself and didn't really get out of the car to do any investigating or anything like that. But I drove around an old abandoned mining town and that was my first dive into it, really. I love that you mentioned the legend of Sleepy Hollow because that that animated movie I recall quite fondly, and it it definitely scared, uh, you know, provided me with a joyful fright as a child. I love the the scary Disney era, and I feel like that is definitely something that I hope that we will return to. It seems like maybe Disney is finally willing to, to embrace a little bit of the spooky side again, because you know, kids, it's good for a kid to experience that, that safe, spooky horror vibe. Oh yeah. And I, uh, old shows like, uh, our old Disney classics, like escape to Witch mountain and bed knobs and broomsticks and all of those wonderfully creepy shows were things that I grew up with. And they're movies that a lot of the younger generation hasn't heard of. So you bring up like Ray Bradbury's uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, and they'd have no idea what that's about. And that is a horribly creepy movie. <laughs> It is. It is. It, that's. I love that you brought that up. Yeah, John. Is it Jonathan Price? I, I believe that was yes, the yeah. uh, the the illustrated man or the um, the the man in black. I forget the character's oh, name, but I love. Yeah, I and I love, I love the book by Bradbury, but the, uh, but and that movie was not necessarily the best adaptation, but it still creeped me out quite a bit as a kid. So. For you, you founded the paranormal team Moonspenders, which is also your Twitter handle in 1999. Tell me a little bit about the makeup of that group. And is that something that's still active? Do you still investigate? Oh. It is not, unfortunately. Um, uh, well, it's it was sort of something that I ventured into uh, back. This was back in college, 1998-1999, when I started out on with an AOL hometown website. It's been that long, uh, but it took inspiration from uh, a book. Uh, Jonathan Gash wrote a series that was turned into a British television series called the Lovejoy Mysteries. And one of his books uh, was called The Moonspenders. It was about these people who went out and dug up antiquities in the secret of night and sold them on the black market. And I thought that would be a perfect name for a paranormal group, even though we're not stealing things. We're out in the middle of the night venturing to try and find old things from the past, basically. Uh, so I started out as a solo expedition and slowly grew from there to a group of friends. It grew into a decent sized group of a few dozen people. And then it just the juggling of a paranormal group uh, with everything else and trying to schedule things and day-to-day -day life just taking over. It kind of fell out of favor a bit and I just had to let it go uh, I've belonged to a few different paranormal groups over the years, though, but um, basically, uh, I've been a lone wolf for a long time now. I just, uh, there's a lot of drama in the paranormal, as I'm sure you and most people are aware of, uh, and sometimes it just, it gets to be a bit too much. <laughs> I, it does seem, you know, the paranormal world, I, I, I sort of think maybe that's just a a result of getting anybody together as enthusiasts for long enough and 
there's drama and politics and egos and everything just starts to uh, come out to play a little bit. So uh, yeah, I, there is drama in the paranormal community, but I think there's probably drama in any collected group. The and and just a a quick note, Ken. I think we've lost your video feed, and he's back. Oh. Okay, there you go. Yeah, and, it's, great. It's right. uh, went fuzzy, and then and, uh, I didn't realize I had to start it back up again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, uh, as I mentioned, of course, we are doing, you know, I'm, we're, we're a pond apart here. So uh, I just assume that there's going to be little hiccups with, with technology. And thankfully that doesn't matter for the people that are listening to this on audio. That So Queer Hauntings is a, both, it's such an obvious thing to, to write about. And yet it's not really a topic that, has been written about outside of your book. It's this, to my knowledge, you were the first person to write about it. So I guess my question to you is why? Why Why did you decide I'm gonna tackle this and this is going to be my, my research for this book? Well, it... I would say it started basically in college when I started investigating the paranormal more in depth than just the basic research and reading I'd done before that. Uh, I was also the treasurer of a gay and lesbian group at Kent State University. So it was sort of like living two lives. I had the paranormal side of my life and then I had the LGBT rights uh, aspect of my life. And I'd never really thought of a crossover at all. It would never dawned on me. I just, I'm used to the same old stories of straight couples and the ghosts that come from that. Uh, but then just one day, I just was kind of just thinking about, you never hear about gay ghosts. There have to be gay ghosts. If there are gay people, there have to be gay ghosts because ghosts are reflective of the society that we are. So I started looking for answers and was not finding anything because there really wasn't anything written about it other than a few jokes here and there online. Uh, but then I started stumbling across different stories one at a time. And at the time I was big blogging and I had sort of a paranormal humor type of blog. Um, and I started finding enough stories that I started creating these little queer paranormal road trips, as I called them, where I would talk about this alleged gay haunting and give a little backstory about it and just start bringing things out into the public. And then after a while, I started getting enough stories. I'm like, there might be something in this. I'd like to do a book on it because nobody else has done this yet. Uh, so I finally collected enough stories and luckily found a publisher and uh, had that come out. And that was uh, 2009 now when the book came out. So it's 13 years old. Uh, but then I just kept on researching in the quiet time in between. Uh, even with a day job and everything else like that. But I've just, it's always been something that intrigued me being gay myself. I always wondered, you know, that's something that's never really discussed. And one thing I've learned through research is that's almost deliberate in a way, because in the history of psychical research, getting people to take you seriously is always a challenge. It's always been an issue with getting funding for research projects and any mention of sex and sexuality makes a lot of people turn away instantly. So a lot of past researchers have deliberately avoided any mention of or sexuality because that would basically be taboo. There's a taboo on top of another taboo. So they just wanted to keep the research going by avoiding topics like that that could cause issues with other people. The within so you know certainly different cultures and different communities discuss the paranormal or in in various ways or sometimes 
choose not to discuss the paranormal to acknowledge it is a taboo in of itself so you're talking about the research side of things but even though even though the the queer community is not a monolith is it were you finding there was a reluctance amongst eyewitnesses to discuss this phenomena and why do you think that is if if that is the case well there's there's definitely a social stigma uh, even today it's not as bad as it used to be but there's definitely a social stigma with admitting that you've seen something that's thoroughly unexplainable and there's always the worry about people thinking you're crazy uh, so that's always on people's minds but i think i think a lot of it too is it's just we don't as a community uh as a queer community we don't focus so much on death as we do focusing on living life so death is avoided because we don't want to focus on the bad because enough bad things have happened to the gay community over the years so we want to focus on the positive which can be a downfall because then you forget these other things because most of the stories end up being like local stories that are just kept within a small group of people but some of them do manage to escape uh, and turn into public attractions there have been some places that i have researched that have actually been on paranormal television most of the time they've avoided any mention of any kind of lgbtq uh, references but there have been quite a few cases where they avoid that even today as bringing it up at all. Yeah, and something that I've I've talked a lot about is that it is a from an entertainment genre, the paranormal is very much dominated by a Christian ethic and and is the cis gender white males you know the, it seems like there is a very you know ruling kind of class to this wh whereas that's such a, a a narrow perspective when you're talking about the paranormal that you know we're talking about a a world of diverse opinions and ideas the a, the, I guess the question, I guess, connected to that would be, do you think that there might be more openness to talk about things? Because I, I imagine also, like, with, within the queer community, like, you just don't want to draw attention to yourself. There was a time where you would not want to draw attention to yourself because, you know, the, the society was not accepting. So as we have become a more accepting society, does that mean that people may be more willing to talk about these kinds of experiences from the community? I think there's definitely more of an interest now than there has ever been. Um, I know that in the past I've had always had issues getting people to talk about personal experiences. Um, but being the one person who everyone knew was a paranormal investigator, people always felt more open to talking to me about things because they knew at least I wouldn't think that they were crazy. Uh, but I think with uh, all the mainstream paranormal television that has happened over the past 15, 20 years, I think there's been a lot of exposure out there and it's a lot more better received in a lot of ways. So I I think people are open to expressing those interests, but also as as a gay community and a queer community, we are more interested in our history than we were. We definitely have our martyrs like Harvey Milk and uh, others. And that way, it, when there's a lot of stories attached to famous people from the queer community, who when we want to bring up the past and keep it alive a bit that's also another beneficial way of bringing out the past a bit more and bringing it back into the present and 
what and and let me just also say for anybody that is watching this as a live stream get your questions out there for ken so we can post those and what would you say are there any within certain kinds of phenomena there's tropes there's repeating patterns you have the lady in white ghost uh is there any kind of sort of patterns uh almost tropes within these queer hauntings that you've, that you've noticed any, any patterns such as that? There, there have been a few patterns that I have noticed, not all humorous in some ways, because there have been a lot of cases of female spirits or spirits that are believed to be females that have, possibly been males actually i know there's one case out there's a bed and breakfast out in provincetown called the rosen crown and the former owner of it passed away from aids he was a big aids activist but he always dressed up in a white wedding gown for carnival out there and people have seen him in that dress in his house but if people didn't realize who it was, they would just assume that it was a woman in white. So there's a lot of times where the clothing someone is wearing may be more questionable than people realize. Uh, but also at the same time, there's a lot of cases I've come across of uh, hate crimes and violence uh, toward the queer community that has led off into a haunting such as the case with the Capitol Theater in Clearwater, Florida, where the former manager was gay and picked up some men at a bar, took them back to the theater, and they murdered him and robbed him. And his ghost has been seen in the theater. But a lot of people don't realize the whole backstory with it. There was a story of the captain, as they called him, and that was supposed to be the man that haunted the theater, but they didn't realize that there was a particular hat that he always wore at all times. And that was the hat that he wore. It looked kind of like a ship captain's hat. Uh, but that was just another clue that he was the, actually the one that was haunting the building. The, what are, what are some of the other, what are the, some of the historical sites that you believe to be haunted? And you mentioned even some have appeared on various paranormal TV shows, but sites with, with historic significance to the queer community that you believe are haunted? Well, the one that was, that has historical significance and was mentioned on TV, which is actually uh, connected with Adam Barry because it was featured on Ghost Hunters and he investigated it. And that's sort of the episode where he pretty much came out of the closet television wise uh that would have been uh the upstairs lounge in new orleans where an arsonist bombed the stairway on a sunday afternoon and killed i believe it was 32 or 33 people who were trapped in the flames upstairs because there was no way out all the windows had bars on them so it was it was a huge fiasco. Uh, one of the victims was left in the window for something like 12 hours with his burnt corpse in the window without anyone taking his body away or anything like that. It took the city of New Orleans 25 years to apologize for how bad they handled the whole mess. Nobody was ever arrested for it. But that's long been a legendary place where the ghosts of those victims still hang out. Uh, there's, but there's also quite a few other places that are a little bit less tragic. Uh, another New Orleans place would be uh, the Eagle in Exile. No, what am I saying? Mm -hmm. uh, not Eagle in Exile. I'm thinking of a different, different bar altogether. Uh, Cafe Lafitte in Exile. Uh, that one is actually haunted by two famous gay ghosts. Tennessee Williams and Truman Capote. They both haunt the same bar in different locations, even though they hated each other in real life. Uh, Truman Capote strikes up conversations in the stairway leading to the upstairs, and Tennessee Williams is seen in his favorite bar stool, sitting there looking stout, drinking a whiskey. So there are 
a lot of different places, a lot of over, overseas in England as well. There's quite a few different haunted pubs and such. There's not really a well-known one for the United States, but a very, very historically significant haunting uh, in Wales. It's a place called Plasnawid in Langollen, Wales. It was home of the ladies of Langollen. Uh, they were a couple who unofficially married and eloped together and moved into the countryside this house and built this gigantic place in the early or to late 18th century so it was quite a long time ago but they were very beloved in their community they hosted poets and artists and they were extremely popular with the the locals there they are buried in the cemetery together even, but their house is still haunted by them to this very day. And even even though it's not quite paranormal, it's leaning toward the occult, where you're at right now has uh, some definite significance with Boleskine House, Alistair Crowley's place that burnt almost to the ground, but is being restored currently off of Loch Ness. That place is supposed to be haunted by uh, possibly Crowley himself, along with all the other questionable, evil, and people believe he may have conjured up over the years. He was pretty well known as being bisexual. He was very much an obnoxious person, so a lot of people don't care for him too much, but but he was very openly, and he even wrote a book of homoerotic poetry called White Stains back when he was in his early 20s. <laughs> and it's what I what I appreciate. I was going to ask about this is that, you know, it seems like there might be this assumption that a lot of the ghost stories um you know, LGBTQ ghost stories are coming from the last 50 years, last 100 years, but you just gave some very historic uh, examples that this is obviously much like, you know, gay people are nothing new, gay ghosts are nothing new. Exactly. Even Walt Whitman is supposed to haunt the hills that he used to hike in the New York area. Uh, actually, the Walt Whitman Trail, as it's called, is haunted by his ghost, who still goes out for long walks. I'm I'm surprised that uh, the there was I was th I was thinking about you know people love to say like the most haunted city and uh, as if uh, ghosts are filling out a uh, census form, but I, I was surprised to see that there were not any stories coming out of Key West, which is you know, a vibrant community of importance and and also just colorful characters. And sometimes those very colorful characters tend to lead, create colorful ghosts. Oh, yeah. I, I was surprised, too. I did look into Key West, and there are a ton of ghost stories there. But I have not yet been able to find uh, anything with any kind of queer bent to it. But... You, it's, it's hard to predict where these stories are going to come from. I've stumbled across stories from as far away as Sweden and uh, Philippines, and then just strange stories of creatures in Africa that may or may not be either in the paranormal realm or cryptozoology, depends on who you ask and what you believe. But yeah, there's the most unexpected places. Sometimes you'll find these strange stories like rural Indiana. There's a haunted cemetery that's by a gay ghost. Well, what's your favorite uh, funny, cheeky uh, ghost uh, story from either your book or other, other research that you've conducted? Uh, Probably my favorite story uh, is going to be coming out in the next book that is still trying to find a publisher. Uh, 
but it was one of those strange accidents of reading through a normal paranormal book and finding something you would never expect in a million years. Uh, it was told by uh, a well-known investigator at the time, back in the 1940s and 50s. His name was Nander Fodor. And he was open-minded enough to have gay and lesbian friends. And he had a female lesbian friend whose lover had passed away. And after a period of grieving, she had moved on. She was staying at a hotel in New York City and invited another woman to spend the night with her. And before this whole thing had happened, uh, after her lover had passed away, she was trying to contact her former lover through a medium out in California and had minuscule success, but she wasn't sure whether she could trust the medium, which is still the case with a lot of mediums. You have to, there are some really good mediums and there are some really bad ones. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, I digress. She was in bed with this other woman and all of a sudden the phone starts ringing and her female companion was getting very uncomfortable. Uh, so her female companion left and she spent the night alone and in the morning went downstairs to have a long talk with the man at the lobby about how rude he was to be waking her up in the middle of the night like that and and interrupting her and how she was going to have his job and that was just disgraceful and he apologized saying i i didn't mean to interrupt anything i didn't mean to upset you i the person on the other line said it was vitally important that i get a hold of you so she got the phone number it was the psychic the psychic she called the psychic back and asked what was going on. She said, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to bother you, but your lover came through to me and demanded that I contact you immediately because she had a very important message for you. And she asked her what the message was. The message was simple. It was, I am so disappointed in you. So her lover could not get over the fact that she was moving on, even though she was dead. So just to make sure that she knew that she didn't approve of her dating another woman, she had to come through and send her message and have her voice. I, I, I do love that. That's the jealous. Uh, she's moved on, but can't mm -hmm. move on. <laughs> the, uh, anything, anything. Oh, there's that... a lot of jealousy out there. And sometimes it just never dies. <laughs> yeah. Any any stories of I'm thinking specifically of this TV show Ghosts on CBS, which I quite like, and they have this Revolutionary War. Uh, I believe I think he's a, a general, and he is a ghost who basically comes out in the afterlife. He becomes a little bit more open and aware of his sexuality, and I was kind of curious. Uh, has there been any stories where it almost seems like in on the other side there's become this awareness that or acceptance of, of who they were in life? It's hard to tell because a lot of these stories you don't know. They've, it's been so long. You don't know for sure how open they were or aware they were of their sexuality when they were alive. I do know that there is uh, there's one pub in England where there's a female uh, barmaid ghost who likes to pinch women on the rear. And then there's another pub in England where there's a male former baker who likes to unzip men's trousers. Uh, so there's a lot of questions there. Uh, there's another bed and breakfast up in New England with a Revolutionary War era ghost who apparently is gay, at least according to the owner of the inn, even though it was featured recently on a television show and they did not mention anything about the gay ghost, which is strange because the book that mentions it was written by the innkeeper who still owns the building. <laughs> 
What, what can you say that will you say the name of the I'm trying to remember the name of it uh I, I, there's so many bed and breakfasts out there and i think i want to say it was investigated by ghost hunters okay but i cannot remember the name i i know there's a cemetery right next to it I can remember that, and the owner's name starts with an M. Um, but yeah, my brain just, it, I have too many stories in my head to try and keep track of. <laughs> I, I'm the same way. I, I'll do a lot of research, and I'll, I'll, I, it's, it's all jumbled up in there. So I pull it out at <laughs> times when I need to, but then sometimes specifics just get, I need to refresh myself before I do a presentation or something because I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the thing I have to say. This, we have this question that I think, I think there is some merit here about do, have you found that queer ghosts tend to be angry or compared to other ghosts because of how they were treated by society during their lifetime. And I think this notion of, of angry ghosts because of how they were mistreated is something that we've seen within some stories. So have you found cases like this within your research? Surprisingly, I, that's, that is a very good question, but surprisingly, I really haven't encountered vengeful spirits like that. Even the cases of people who were murdered, uh, whether it's a hate crime or otherwise, it seems like they've found a peace, if anything, and they either have a good sense of humor about everything uh, and have a little bit of fun with the living, like in the case of Liberace, who likes to lock women in the women's stalls in the restroom, or at least back when his restaurant was still open. Uh, but... A lot of times, no. I, I find most of them are either at peace or they are just simply unaware or they are trying to get help and trying to get people right. to help them find whoever did this to them. So, Ken, I'm going to take just a brief break and we'll be back with you momentarily. But I want to talk to all my spooky nerds out there because I'm going to be heading to RTX in Austin, Texas this July 1st through 3rd. And I would love to meet some of our talking strange listeners and viewers out there. RTX Austin is the world's greatest podcasting, gaming, and animation convention that brings incredible entertainment and the best community on the planet together for a wild weekend of fun and surprises. You can experience the best in podcasting, gaming, animation. You can see your favorite podcast personalities over three days of panels, live shows, special events, meet and greets, and more. And we, I, will be doing a special live recording of Talking Strange at RTX. And we're going to have a lot of great Austin researchers and paranormal authors and podcasters on stage talking about all things spooky in Austin. So don't ghost me. Instead, show up in corporeal form. Go to rtxevent.com. Use promo code DEN OF GEEK to purchase your admission badge at a discount, or you can go to bit.com. L Y slash den of geek RTX. So let's get weird and I will see you in Austin. All right. And we are back with Ken Summers and he is the author of queer hauntings, true tales of gay and lesbian ghosts. And you know, it's not just ghosts that you research. You have, placed uh, a perspective of you on the larger paranormal. And I want to talk a little bit about that. You, you touched on it briefly, but what are the other queer community, queer connections to the paranormal that extend beyond ghosts that, that you're fascinated by? 
Well, first, I ran to my library really quick, my research library, and that inn I was talking about is the Captain Grant Inn. So, oh, right. I know the Captain Grant uh, Inn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I had to find it. I, it was going to drive me nuts otherwise. Uh, <laughs> that's the good thing about having a very big research library of books. Um, I'm sorry. You were asking me about... Larger, Other... larger, high strangeness. The beyond yes. just ghosts. <laughs> well, uh, there is an interesting. There's a lot of interesting work in ufology that largely ignored, dealing with sexuality. I mean, aside from the anal probes that everyone focuses on, but there's there's a lot of research that has been done, surprisingly, on people who aren't straight who have been abducted. Uh, there's actually a book about abductions that mentioned that their own research found, a, I think somewhere around a third of cases of abduction phenomena involves people who either identify as bisexual, gay or lesbian, or somewhere else on the spectrum on the Kinsey scale. And there was a well-documented case from the it spanned the 1950s to the 1970s, really, written by Anne Druffel and D. Scott Rogo, called the Tahunga Canyon Encounters, which chronicles a group of five to seven women, some of them in varying relationships with each other, who all experienced some sort of abduction phenomena at varying times, either when they were connected with others in that group or after other people in their friend group had experienced something of that nature. And so there's a lot of things with ufology that are outside of what you would expect to hear. And I think of it, I, aliens are another big mystery, whether they are truly people from a different planet or if they're just from another dimension or just like I've postulated before, even possibly time travelers from a future that we aren't aware of yet. Uh, there is a lot of strangeness with it. And, but if you're investigating a species, you would want to know all of the aspects of it, not just the general population, you want to know all the outliers of the whole group too. So it would make sense to me that uh, that something like that would be possible, that people who weren't straight would experience something similar to that. Um, I know even in, uh, in the cryptozoology world, uh, Lauren Michael, not Lauren Michaels, what am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Coleman, um, I, I'm just catching myself on a Saturday Night Live reference and I don't know why. Uh, Lauren, <laughs> Lauren Coleman uh, actually postulated back in the early 2000s about why is, couldn't Bigfoot be gay? Couldn't there be gay Bigfoots out there somewhere? And it was a big big blow up at the time about how dare you mention something like that. But it's a logical question, thinking from a biological standpoint. And there have been some interesting creature encounters that make things questionable with that. There was the Popobawa of Zanzibar, which is the bat demon that was actually investigated by Josh Gates back on his first show. I don't remember if that was Destination Unknown, or if that was called something else. I can never remember. Uh, Destination but Truth. But he went out there. Destination Truth, yes, that's right. Uh, wasn't too much mention about the whole story behind it, but allegedly it was thought to be this djinn or genie or whatever you want to call it, uh, spirit type of entity instead of an actual physical cryptid who would be sent out to rape men at night but had this peculiar thing of 
it would come back the next night and the same thing if you didn't tell anyone about your encounter with him. So there's a lot of weird stuff out there in every single aspect of the paranormal. And it's, it's just fascinating to find so many different stories and everything that you could possibly think of. And every time I think that I won't find something in some aspect of the paranormal, I do. I, I, occultism, um, different occultists, it, there's a lot of um, sexual, sex magic and things like that that have been written about over the years. There's a lot of different people who've been involved in various forms of magic who've been gay, bi, lesbian. There was also another, there was a trans activist in the 1970s who was big on ufology. And she actually claims that her best friend was a lizard man. So okay. you, you never know what you're going to find. <laughs> well, and, and you mentioned... Uh, the the jinn obviously a big part of of uh, Muslim belief in the Quran the jinn are considered very real, but other cultures mm -hmm. other belief systems uh, have have it's almost like it's it's not a new thing to talk about uh, queer entities or ghosts or whatever because we've got stories of the two spirit indigenous peoples or uh, I believe some Hindu deities that uh, mm -hmm. are are either bisexual that are gay that are you know uh, or androgynous so this this kind of goes back throughout many cultures for millennia really absolutely you find uh, in a lot of different cultures around the world you find that there's a certain spirituality associated with queer individuals, uh, over not only with the, the two spirit, uh, which for those who aren't aware, it's basically the native belief of basically someone having both male and female genders in a single person. Uh, but yes, there's a lot in Hinduism, uh, in Buddhism, in every single culture that I've come across, even when you get into Yoruba, uh, in Africa and um, Haitian voodoo, there's a lot of voodoo beliefs that have strange, sexually ambiguous deities involved with them. Actually, my cat is named after one of them. I named him Nebo, which is short for Gede Nebo, who is this voodoo spirit who is the protector of those who die tragically young. He was also a very effeminate character, and he's very much identified with the LGBTQ community nowadays. Fascinating. Well, and, and it, it really is a beautiful thing as far as people are people. People have always been people, and, and people come in all forms. It's just we sometimes like to think that this is – that that – people are suddenly different or changing. It's like, no, this is, people have always been people. Absolutely. And sexuality is always a touchy subject. But yeah. one thing you find when you do historical research on the paranormal, you find that sexuality has a very strong connection with paranormal research, phenomena, parapsychology, all of that. Even uh, Donald J. West, who was a member of the Society of Psychical Research. He was a president of that organization. He did a research study in the 1950s and discovered using uh, a form of Zener card, which for those unfamiliar, that is the ESP cards with the plus sign, the wavy lines, the circle, the square, all that. Uh, but he used erotic symbols instead and found that actually using some kind of sexually connotated symbols increases someone's psychic abilities. And actually, people test better using a sexual symbolism as opposed to just a bland, meaningless number system. That's fascinating. 
So before we wrap up, just I have a couple questions. Uh, one is from Kat in the audience, and she wants to know, have you heard of any spirits that have visited family and friends to come out to them? Maybe they didn't feel comfortable in life, but now as spirits, they do. I wish I had. That would be a wonderful story. I I have not come across, I've come across a lot of stories of people who visit family members after they pass away. That's a very, very common thread in the paranormal period. Uh, I did find one story researched by a friend of mine out in the Southwest, who's also an author, about an AIDS patient who passed away while this doctor was on leave. And when he came back in the first day before he had a chance to go to his office, he actually saw him in his hospital room standing in the window, which was a surprise to him because he never thought that he would be well enough to stand on his own. And he asked him how he was doing and he told him, I'm feeling wonderful and it's so beautiful outside. And right after that, he went into his office to find out that he had passed away five days before. Yeah. I mean, I, I love those kinds of stories. And I also, if, if we're, I, I often think of, you know, the paranormal or the idea of ghosts is, and there's so many different ideas, but I do think part of it is like some sort of afterlife therapy, like, you know, working through your yeah. issues that maybe we didn't really finish uh in in our normal lives so hopefully cat hopefully people are able to complete that journey and then choose to move on at at their at their discretion the final question is of course this is this is pride month this is timely because also kirsten stewart just announced her i think she called it her big gay ghost hunting show and and I know for a fact that it's already gotten crazy response and it's been trending and it's fascinating. So if you can summers who literally wrote the book on queer hauntings, if you were to offer any advice to Kristen Stewart or any hopes, expectations out of this show, what are some of the things that you would do that you would advise? Well, that is very interesting. I, well, since I come from a, a more parapsychological background with my approach to the paranormal, I do like to, I like to see honesty and integrity above everything else. Uh, that's not to say that TV shows don't always do things justice or anything like that. But there are certain times when there's an important time to be serious and reflective and treat things with the proper respect. And there's plenty of time to have fun in the meantime. People tend to either believe that ghosts are scary and evil or sort of a a non-belief kind of aspect where they just don't exist at all. It's all a figment of people's imaginations. And I, I don't like people who go too far with the scare factor. I, I like to keep things normal. Not everyone should be afraid of a ghost if or whatever phenomena is going on. It's, it's an unknown thing. You don't know exactly what's going on. Just like when you meet someone on the street, you can't assume that that person is going to stab you and take your wallet because then you would just live in constant fear and you would never live. Um, but there's always time to have fun and not take death as seriously as so many people do take it. But there are certain times when things need to be looked at. Uh, also, research, research. It's and a very vitally important role with anything. Uh, it's difficult sometimes, speaking as someone who took 10 years to write another book. Uh, it's very difficult, especially in this field where you're looking for something so outlandish and different that you never think you're gonna find anything. Definitely keep up on the research. Uh, make sure that people work well together 
and can get along. And I would suggest not having everyone in the group agree on everything. Have a nice eclectic group of people from different backgrounds, different belief systems, different philosophies of everything. Because yeah, there's, there's a lot of theories in the paranormal and not all of them are ever touched on. It tends to get a little bit coagulated after a while and it's all the same. And you, there's a lot of things out there that cause fear among people that shouldn't cause fear because it's just something people don't understand. Mm -hmm. Well, Ken, I mean, I hope that, I mean, I'm optimistic about this show, but I'm also hopeful I think they definitely need to give you a phone call and anyone that's paying attention to this show, I would say, you know, raise, raise that, uh, as a, as a message on the social media, like, like Kristen Stewart. No, because this gentleman is definitely the, the expert that should, the expert researcher that should be included in this. And, with that said, uh, Ken, I, I really, I really appreciate you joining me again. Ken Summers, Queer Hauntings, True Tales of Gay and Lesbian Ghosts. Check him out, and uh, everybody can find you uh, on Twitter as well. At uh, uh, one more time, Ken, tell us. My Twitter handle is Moonspenders. Uh, basically, everything is Moonspenders. My website is Moonspenders.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram, even though I don't push, that is also Moonspenders. So if you're Moonspenders, you're bound to find me. All right, Ken Summers, thank you so much uh, for your time. This was just excellent. This was such a great conversation. I appreciate it. And for everyone out there, thank you for joining. Don't forget to subscribe. Download every week, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can watch the video interviews at youtube.com slash us, and give me a follow on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, on Patreon, at Aaron Sager, and also at Talk Strange Pod on Twitter. And until next time, be kind, stay spooky, and keep it weird. Music.